where hopefully the pace will slow down for us and we can take a second to realize that you are not far, you are not distant, but you are a near and present King. We thank you for the journey that you have us on in spiritual life here at Kings. We thank you for this day that has been prayed over for months now. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, that even as we are far from you, you continue to pursue us. I ask today that you would be with Robert Madhu, that you would be with Pastor Robert, that you would be in his words, that the very um, truth that you've spoken thousands of years ago would be breathed in again today, that as we hear the truth this morning, that lives would leave this room unchanged. We thank you, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please welcome Pastor Robert Madhu. Thank you. Good morning, Kings. Come on, anybody excited to be in chapel this morning? Yes. We walked right into that. Who, who was excited that school is almost out? Make some noise for that. Hey, I looked at it earlier, but I want to do this again. I think we ought to always give honor to our honors, too. And I think you guys were blessed this morning to have that incredible worship team in there. Can we thank God for them? Wasn't that awesome? Come on, y'all can do better than that, man. Go, go, I almost do it on the beat right here in chapel, but hey, I am excited to be here. I'm glad to have my chocolate face in the place. I have been waiting to get here to this amazing school, and what an opportunity you have, uh, man, to lift up the name that is above every name, whose name is Jesus, and uh, we're going to have fun in chapel today. Is that cool? It's going to be a little lit. I'm a little too old to say it, but I'm going to say it. And, uh, and I want to thank God for Mr. Kimfield for your amazing leader. Can we thank God for him? He invited me to come here, so I'm glad. Yeah, he did. I bring you greetings from the great country of Texas. Uh, come on, I live there in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the home of God's team, America's team, the Cowboys. Come on, some uh, future Super Bowl champions. And uh, this is true. We have to say it to believe it. And uh, I've been married for, let's see, four years, three months, eight days, six minutes and 22 seconds to the finest woman on the planet. Her name is Taylor, and she is at home with my two kids. I left my two amazing kids uh, to be here with you uh, today because I so believe in your generation. And I believe if the world is gonna change, it's gonna happen through you, amen? Amen. So I wanna share some, uh, something that is really dear on my heart. I wanna look at 2 Timothy today. 2 Timothy uh, chapter one, verses one through seven, and then we'll look at Genesis chapter two, verse number seven. When you're ready to read the Bible, just say, yeah. yeah. Not ready to read it, say, hold up. Why are you holding up? You ain't even got no Bible. Come on. Awesome. <laughs> Look at what it says. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwell first in your grandmother Lewis and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, Hashtag, don't be scared. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Can y'all say amen? amen? And then Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, just one verse of scripture. And it says, God formed man out of dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living soul. I want to uh, just share with you, and not long today, just from this thought, it's in you. It's in you. Would you look at the person next to you, get in their face, get in their personal space, and just say, hey, it's in you. Come on, look at the other person next to you, get all up in their grill, get in their personal space, and say, hey, it's in you. Now come on, let's pray, let's pray. <laughs> you ain't got to move. Somebody's like, that's my opportunity. Come on, let's, let's pray. Would you bow your hands? Joy is, let's pray. Let's ask God to speak to us today. This is going to be a long prayer. It's going to be a long prayer. Just bear with me. Would you bow your hands? God, you are awesome. Speak to us today. Amen. 
quick, uh, quick survey, quick survey before we jump into this. How many would say, how many would say by a show of hands that you were raised in church? Can I see your hand if you were raised in church? Oh, Lord, that's almost everybody. Let me keep, keep it up. Raised in church. I, I just need to see who needs the counseling. Uh, no, I'm not. You can put it down. You can put it down. Uh, I'll lift up my hand, too, with you. I'll let you know that I was raised in church. And if you lift up your hand, how many you know the life of a church kid is distinctly different than the life of a regular kid? Oh, come on, somebody. It, it, it is totally different. There are trials and tribulations and situations that you go through as a church kid that other kids don't even know. And I know this too well because growing up in my household, we had to be in church. Every day the doors were open, had to be in church. It was not a democracy. It was a dictatorship, okay? Had to be in church. In fact, I remember one day as a kid, I got bold, I got a little brave, and did something I probably should have done. I looked at my dad, I looked at my father, I said, Dad, I ain't going this Sunday. I don't feel like it's time to me. I ain't going this Sunday. I told my father that. I told my father that. I told my Nigerian father that, okay? That's not true. And uh, do you know what you know my Nigerian man said to me? He said, let me tell you something, boy. Let me tell you something. You have two options, huh? You can get out of bed and go to church, or I can kill you. And we will go to church and have your funeral. But either way, you will be in church. Because as for me at my house, we will serve the Lord. Before I grab my spear, get something to go to church, boy. That's the environment I grew up in. It's hard out here for a church here. Without my mama hitting you with this question. This is my mom's question. What's your favorite scripture? Before you can eat food, you have to give a scripture. Y'all don't know hunger until your mind is racing to find a scripture just so you can eat some food. I looked at my mama one day and I said, Jesus wept. Give me the chicken, okay? Why are you playing with people's food? This is stupid. That is the environment that I grew up in. I'm thankful that's the environment that I grew up in. And today, I'm going to reverse the question my mama asked at the dinner table and not ask you what your favorite scripture is, but ask you, have you ever considered what your least favorite scripture is? Your least favorite. I know mine. We read it today. It is in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. The Bible says that God created man from the very dirt of the earth. Let that bless you for a minute there, okay? If you are ever tempted to be stuck up and think you all that in a can of Pringles, you need to do a Bible study on Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. Because the Bible is clear. We did not all come from some celestial substance. Every single one of us came from dirt. I want to do an exercise. I think it'll be helpful for your self-esteem here at King's Academy. Would you do me a favor? Look at the person to your left. And just look at them. Look at them. Uh -huh. Look at the person to your right. Look at them real good. Uh -huh. Look at the person behind you. Look at them real good. Uh -huh. Look at the person in front of you. Uh -huh. Look at them real good. Watch this. Watch this. Every single person you looked at, every single person you looked at, according to the Word of God, is a dirt bag. Yes. Yes. 
know that God doesn't do anything ordinary. God does everything extraordinary. Come on, you do know that you serve a great God. He created the stars. He created the sky. He created galaxies. He spoke the world into existence. You do know he's the interior designer of heaven, right? He did the streets in gold. He did the gates in pearl. But when he got ready to create you and I, his prized possession, the one he sent his only son to die on the cross for, of all the things he could have used, he said, let's use I was so mad. I was so ticked off at God. I said, hold on. Streets get gold, but we get dirt. That's my stuff. And God started speaking to me. Hear my heart. He started speaking to me. He said, Robert, don't get mad. Get glad. And he started revealing to me the nature of his character that he showed us all the way in the book of Genesis. Hear me, King's Academy. You ought to thank God today because you serve a God who is holy. But he's not afraid to work with things that are dirty. You serve a God who is awesome, but yet he's not afraid to work with things that are awful. You serve a God who is magnificent, but yet he works with things that are ordinary and mundane. And I want to thank God that when everybody else says, get that dirt away from me, get that messed up person away from me, get that crazy, dirty situation away from me, God says, no, bring me that dirt. And that dirt you think can't be used, that person you think can't be used, that person that you think is disqualified, that's the person that I'll actually put my hands on and I will use them. As a matter of fact, I will breathe into some dirt and it will become alive and become a living soul. Come on, how many are thankful that God can still work with dirt? Would you give us some praise up in here? That's good news. See, if you shut up, man, we on to the bathroom. You got to go to the bathroom? We on to the bathroom? Go to the bathroom? Okay, go ahead. Really? In the middle of the message? Dirt will do the craziest things, huh? Oh, God! God works with dirt. Can I take you deeper? Hear me, please, Kathy. Dirt, watch this. Dirt is the only environment. Dirt is the only environment that you can put a seed in. See, you can't put a seed in gold. You can't put a seed in a diamond. You can't put a seed in a ruby. But if you have some dirt, you can put a seed in it and watch it reach its optimal potential. I don't care how nutritious the vegetation or how beautiful the flower. If the gardener never places the seed in dirt, it will never reach its potential. And I want to submit to you that although you came from dirt, there is a seed on the inside of every single one of us, and that seed is a gift. Before the foundation of the earth, God put a gift in every single one of us, and he is waiting for you to stir up the gift that is on the inside of you. That's why the Apostle Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that it is Christ that is in us, that is the hope of glory. There is a seed in all of us, and that seed is a gift. I love this scripture I read because it's in 2 Timothy. And it's written by this guy named Paul. How many of you know this guy named Paul? He wrote like two-thirds of your New Testament. I love Paul. Paul was awesome. Paul was off the chain. I love Paul because Paul would like send a letter to a city and like revival would break out in the city just from him writing a letter. If Paul was alive today, he would send you a text message and an email that would change your life forever. Paul was amazing. That's why everywhere he went, people tried to stop his ministry. They tried to kill Paul. He said, that's cool because the die is gay. They said, okay, then Paul, don't let you live. He said, that's cool too because the live is Christ. They said, okay, then Paul, we're going to make you suffer. He said, that's cool too because I already know that the present sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory of God that's going to be revealed to me. Paul was off the chain. You couldn't stop him. He lived on purpose and he did everything he could to show people who God was. But Paul is writing the scripture that we read. Watch this. From a jail cell. And you can't really appreciate this text until you know he's writing it from a jail cell. He's literally on death row. Why is that important? Because there's something about knowing you're about to die that will clarify what's really important in your life, right? Oh, come on, y'all. If I told you that you had, like, two days to live, how many of you know getting a new PlayStation game for Christmas and eating some fried chicken after chapel would not be that important to you? Come on, you would want everything that you did to carry great weight and significance because you would know that you are running out of time. So I'm not going to you of all the things Paul could have written about in the last moments of his life. He's on death row. He writes to love to this dude named Timothy and says, Timothy, whatever you do, stir up the gift of God that's on the inside of you. What? Paul, he's about to kill you and that's what you write in the last moments of your life? If I'm on death row, I'm writing one letter. Don't kill me. But not Paul. Paul's like, Timothy, whatever you do, listen to me, man. Stir up the gift of God that's in you. Why would Paul do that? Because 
ultimately, that is all that life is about. What did you do with what God put in you? You know, when you get to heaven, God's not going to ask you, were you a Democrat or Republican? Did you go to every chapel service? Did you jump up and down doing your favorite praise and worship song? He's going to want to know, what did you do with the gift? What did you do with the dream that I put on the inside of you? Are you exhaling what I inhaled inside of you before the foundation of the earth? I'll be honest with you today. I'm scared of a lot of things. I'm scared of dogs. I had a bad childhood experience. I'm scared of heights. You'll never catch this brother bungee jumping or skydiving. I'm also scared. I'm also scared of snakes. I'm scared of snakes. But above dogs and snakes and heights, you know what I'm really afraid of? I'm afraid that when I get to heaven, God will flash up on a screen all the things that I did for him. Then he'll flash up on another screen all the things that I could have done with what he put in me. And what I did will dim in comparison to what I could have done. That's what wakes me up every morning, to know there is a gift of God on the inside of me. And I'm wondering, do you know there is a gift of God on the inside of you? And you got to stir it up. Somebody say, stir it up. Oh, come on, wake up the person next to you and say, stir it up. Stir it up. If you go to my parents' house, you go to my parents' house in Dallas, Texas, and you go to the backyard, what you're going to see there is a peach tree. There's this huge peach tree there. And the way that peach tree got there is when I was a kid, I loved peaches. I loved peaches. Still love peaches today. And I remember eating this peach as a kid, and I got down to the seed. And being the precocious kid that I was, I went to my dad. I said, Dad, what is this? And uh, my dad, he said, son, that's the seed. I actually scratched that. I told you my dad's African. So he said, son, that is the seed. And uh, <laughs> so I said, uh, I said, really? He said, son, do you know if you take that seed and you plant it in the ground, a peach tree will come up? I said, nah, -uh, daddy. He said, son, it is true. So true story, my dad and I, we go to the backyard. I am so excited about this peach tree. Like, I'm so excited to have my own peaches. And I went to school the next day and said, I have a peach tree. I have a peach tree. You can have some of my peaches. Y'all will hate on me. You can't get none of my peaches. I mean, I'm so excited about this peach tree, right? After I planted, after I planted, the next day, the next day, I go outside to get my peaches. To my shop, there's no peach tree. I said, okay, maybe need today. Next day, no peach tree. Next day, no peach tree. Next day, no peach tree. No peach tree. No peach tree. No peach tree. By the eighth day, I don't even want to go outside anymore. I am inside the house. My nose is pressed up against the window pane. Tears are cascading down my face. I wish I had a violin. This was sad because I don't have my peach tree. My dad walks in and sees me crying and says, So what is wrong with you? Why are you crying? He said, Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. You're nothing but a liar. You're just a liar. Side note, if your father's African, don't call him a liar, okay? <laughs> Discipline is high on their priorities. Are you calling me a liar? Don't you ever call your father out. outside, asked me a question. He said, have you done anything with this since we planted it? I said, no. He said, son, listen to me. Every day you come home from school, go and get the water hose and water what we planted. Stop crying like a little baby and go and water what we planted. I hope you see where I'm going with this because there's so many people in life that have their nose pressed up against the window pane of their life and you think your heavenly father lied about what he was going to do in you and through you. But God's saying, no, you got to do something with what I put in you. You got to stir up the gift of God that is in you because when you stir it up, that's when you'll see God do the miraculous in your life. Somebody say stir it up. Oh, come on, say it a little louder. Say stir it up. Come on, say it like you had some espresso this morning. Say stir it up. Come on, say it like you had six cases of Red Bull. Say stir it up. And once you begin to stir it up, you begin to say, wait a minute. <laughs> there is a gift on the inside of me. You know what I love about the illustration? It's none of you knew that was in there. Except for me. You know why? Because I'm the one that put it in there. and they say, I don't see that happening. No, I don't see God doing that in your life. Of course you don't see it. You didn't put anything in me. But there is a God that put something on the inside of all of us. Come on, somebody. And if you stir it up, you'll see there is a gift on the inside of you. If you don't get anything else I say, I feel like walking up these stairs, please get this. Just as sure as I'm holding this gift today, every single one of you, every single one, Every single one of you have a gift. You have a gift. Something God has given you to bring glory to Him. And I wonder, do you know what your gift is? You have a gift. 
Everybody has something. Do you know what your gift is? There's so many gifts in this room. I mentioned earlier, I mean, the way they were amazing. They can sing. Your voice is beautiful. That's their gift. They can sing. Some of you, not so much. Amen. And you should sing in the car and lip sync for Jesus. But singing is not your gift, but you got a gift. Everybody has something about the gift. We're all the athletes in here. All my athletes make some noise. That's your gift. That's your gift. Some of you are artists. Some of you are graphic designers. Some of you are leaders. You got a gift. Some of you watch this. Just your personality can be a gift. Just your personality. You ever meet these people that come around and you're like, oh, no, what is this about him? I like him, man. Your personality can be a gift. What is your gift? Do you know what your gift is? Because your gift is what God wants to use to bring him glory. Some of you watch this. This is what really bless you. Just having a good smile can be a gift. I wish people would smile more. You should see some of your faces while we were singing joy to the world. Some of you look like you were sucking on lemons and constipated. Yeah. Right? Hello? Right? Enemy 
people want to not give, that's a bad thing, thing right? Yes. But other people want to not give, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because other people want your gift. Only problem with other people getting your gift, whether you be in a relationship with somebody, a friendship with somebody, no matter what the connection of the gifts are, how many know when you meet that person, they don't just get your gift, they also get your day. And people can handle your gift. But not a lot of people can handle your dirt. Look, this is why most people, you know how we go through life? This is how all humans go through life, just like this. We love to show our gifts and hide our dirt. This is how you meet most people, just like this. Like, we don't want anybody to see the real life. This is why they created filters. <laughs> because we like to show our best and hide the rest. But can I tell you why I love God? Because God saw your gift. He saw your dirt, and he still loves you anyway. Come on, how many of you are thankful for a savior that sees your mess, sees your gifts, sees your dirt, and he still loves you? What do you do when you're trying to handle your gift and handle your dirt? How do you handle the gifted part of you and the messed up part of you? One of the reasons I love reading the Bible it's because the Bible shows us people who were gifted and people that had some dirt. Have y'all noticed the Bible reads like TMZ? Oh, like you gotta read the Old Testament. It shows people who are gifted and people that also had some dirt. People like David, y'all remember David? David was gifted, walked right into the life. Like, hold on, man. No, you ain't gonna talk about my God in front of everybody all night long. Where's my slingshot? I'm about to knock you out. Mama said, knock you out. You don't get knocked out today. I'm not the one. See some of your faces. Some of you are looking at me like, I ain't never read that version before in my life. Let me help you. That is the NIV, okay? Negro International Version. That is a different translation. Somebody knows about it. David was gifted, man. He was so gifted. He was a worshiper and a warrior. Well, watch this. That same David one day was on a rooftop and sent a text message to this girl named Bathsheba said, hey, I saw you taking a bath. You should come over tonight. <laughs> Smiley face. It did dirt! <laughs> Moses was gifted! Moses walked right into Pharaoh's house, kicked open the door, <laughs> fire! Cut the music off, man. God said, God said, let me, no way I stutter a God said, we want to leave. We sick of this, we out. Gifted. And St. Moses committed murder trying to accomplish the plan of God in his own strength. And I know we laugh and have a good time, but every single person in this room, every single person can look at an area of your life and see the gift and see the dirt. Even Superman had some kryptonite. The question is, how are you going to handle the gift and the dirt? And do you know why most of us struggle to handle it? It's because we're trying to handle it. See, the whole time I've been preaching, I've been trying to hold this gift and hold this dirt in my hands. And it's a picture of so many of our lives. We're trying to handle our gift and handle our problems and handle our dirt. And your hands were never meant to handle it. Do you want to know what true freedom that Jesus Christ brings? Is when you take your gift and your dirt and you get it out of your hands and you put it in the hands of the God that created you. You put it in the hands of the God that formed you. You put it in the hands of the God that loves you. When you get it out of your hands, that's what God can do something awesome in your life. I'm done, but I want to tell you today, life is predicated upon whose hands you put something in. Come on, if you put a golf club in my hands, you will get a horrible game of putt-putt golf. But that same golf club in Bubba Watson's hands is a master's championship because it all depends on whose hands you put something in. Come on, if you take a tennis racket and put it in my hands, I'm going to swat a mosquito. But you put that same tennis racket in the hands of Venus or Serena Williams, you got a Wimbledon championship because it all depends on whose hands you put something in. Come on, if you take a basketball and you put it in my hands, it's worth about $20. But you put that same basketball in the hands of LeBron James, it's worth $300 million because it all depends upon whose hands you put something in. Come on, if you take a slingshot and put it in my hands, I can't even hit the backside of this gym. But you put that same slingshot in the hands of a dude named David, he will defeat that terrorist named Goliath so the children of God can get the victory. Whose hands are you going to put your life in? Come on, somebody. If you take a staff and you put it in my hands, I can't do anything with it. But in Moses' hands, a red sea will split and people will walk out of slavery into freedom. Whose hands are you?
or you won't put your life in. Come on, if you take some hammer and nails and put it in my hands, I will build you an ugly birdhouse. But the same hammer, the same nails in the hands of Jesus, come on, we got salvation, we got freedom, we got deliverance, we got hope, we got joy, we got Christmas, we got every single thing that we need. So it all depends on whose hands you put it in. What are you saying, Robert, this Christmas, you ought to stir up the gift of God just put on the inside of you and then say, God, I'm going to take my gift and I'm going to take my dirt. The parts of me that are messed up, that are flawed, I'm going to take it all and I'm going to put it in your hands so you can get the glory out of my life. I'm going to ask every head be bowed, every eye be closed. Jesus, I thank you for these moments. God, what a privilege we had with this amazing school. In a world where so many people are looking for hope, so many people are looking for the answer. What a privilege we have today to join together and to lift up your name. God, God, we know that you are the answer. You are every single thing that we need. God, I thank you for this holiday season. That Christmas is the answer to the problem that all of humanity has. That you have come to be with us. That you took our place. Lord, you died the death that we were supposed to die. You lived the life that we were supposed to live. Lord, I pray today that we would take our gift, we would take our dirt, God, we would put it in your hands. God, I know when we do that, you'll get the glory out of our lives. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed in here today, but if you're here today and you'd be so honest to say, you know what, I need to put my life in his hands. It's so easy to try to do things on your own, try to handle your problems yourself. It's so easy to be in a service like this and laugh and pretend like it's not for you, but the reality is in this room are some amazing, gifted people. There's also some people that got some dirt, some that nobody else even knows about. You're here today to say, I need to put it in God's hands so I can experience that freedom, that peace that comes to the gift of Christmas. That's you. Would you just lift up your hand, just the sign saying, man, this was for me. I'm going to put it in his hand. Just lift it up right where you are. And put it right down. Thank you. Jesus, I thank you for every hand that was lifted. Thank you that we can put our life in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.